Ernest, thank you so much for joining Six Count this afternoon. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So I got to hear you play with Stephen Riley at the Sharp Nine Gallery. And first I wanted to ask about his saxophone because there's a lot of questions for the audience that night. It seems like it's a theme, um, but can you share what was happening there and what made that distinct? I don't know exactly what was happening. I could tell he was, I think annoyed is too strong of a word, but I, I think it's, he's not a, I think the easiest way to look at it, he's not a traditional saxophone player. First, his sound is different. Uh, and I don't know if that, I, I think the woman was asking something about like the back pressure. He was usually look how he was doing a lot, but I know I haven't, I've listened to a lot of saxophonists and Steve has a very, very unique sound. And I think because of that, people are trying to figure out what mechanically it is. And I think the interesting thing about that is I've heard, you know, a lot of people, they, you know, people talk about Charlie Parker and I've heard this in masterclass from saxophones. They say it's not the horn. Mm -hmm. So I think the easiest thing when a person can't, seem to grasp conceptually what you're doing. It has to be some kind of, oh, well, it's a mouthpiece you use. And I think that's why how we kind of veered off top. I think she was trying to figure out, well, how do you sound like that? And it kind of turned into, a, well, why are you using that mouthpiece? And I think, so I think that's where she was trying to go and just didn't know how to lead there. Yeah. And you brought a lot of conversation to the show more than just perhaps your typical banter or description of the song. Right. Can you share why you've decided to bring more of that into these small, intimate audiences? So that's a relatively new thing I've been doing maybe the last five years or so. So I think most of my career, I was the I thought you need to be the brooding artist where you don't talk to the audience and they just have to come and accept your music however it is. And and I think as you get older, you understand the, the people just wanna, they wanna you know enjoy the music, but they wanna have some kind of connection with you and understand, because a lot of times you are playing things that are, unless you're playing some kind of entertainment music, it's going over people's heads. And so over the last few years, I, I've thought, and I think it kind of started at Sharp Nine. I did a, a class over the period of a few months and it was like the history of jazz piano where I started doing that kind of really including people and, and getting them to kind of have an understanding of what they're listening to. So now it's something I do every show. Um, I did it uh, when I was in Wilmington. I had a free community concert that was sponsored by a grant. And, and I just opened it up at one point in middle concert. I said, okay, well, what kind of questions do we have? And it's interesting that like, people have really, really great questions. Like somebody asked, well, what do you think the state of jazz is? And what are some of your influences? So I think because a lot of times we can get into that frame of mind where it's, oh, I'm giving a concert, just sit there and be quiet and enjoy it. It's like, no, you know, what kind of questions do you have? Now, sometimes it can, veer off track uh, where people start asking things that might not be as interesting. But I think overall, it's it, it gives a more pleasant experience. And it, it's one of those things where people are like, oh, I want to go back if for nothing else for the dialogue. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you speak about this in your shows about your improvisation for which you're known for, especially when playing with Stephen. It was just a need to see you playing with each other and veering off and doing your own things in experimentation. What's your philosophy on how you improvise? Well, especially I think that's why me and Steve have such a rapport. We actually improvise. So that's a word that's thrown around a lot in the jazz idiom. But oftentimes what it really means is I'm going to play some of these ideas that I learned from somebody and I've worked out and I'm going to play them at the appropriate time, which is something that when you're teaching, you do kind of teach that uh, kind of recall. But on a when you start to advance, it should be what is happening right now. This song shouldn't sound the same way that it sounded last time we played it. And so I think that's kind of my approach in general with music is if if we're improvising, it should be that this should be a moment that no matter if we're playing the same song with the same group of people that it's, this is going to be, uh, I, when I used to teach, I used to tell, when I taught at ECU, I used to tell the students, make something magical happen. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, make something magical happen. And they're like, oh, I don't know. Make something magical happen. So I think it's one of those, it's, I mean, you could say a lot, you could say, well, play like it's your last time or anything, but it, it just comes down to, I am, I actually saw Frank Zappa said it. And he said, you know, I have a, decent mechanical understanding of the instrument 
But after that, it's whatever. It's okay. The music starts. I'm going to try and do something different this time. So that's, I signed up to play the music for freedom so that I could play whatever I wanted to play, whatever kind of fit in that moment. So, so consequently, I don't do well in situations where it's, well, no, you have to play in a box. Like I didn't do well in big band in college where it's, you have to kind of fit and play the same kind of way. I do better where it's, you can kind of create. So, so yeah, that's my long winded idea of how I improvise. Well, it's truly wonderful to watch you take a more expansive approach to improvisation. And you also seem to be really comfortable stretching the boundaries of pop versus jazz you've performed with John Legend. Is that a fair characterization or how do you think of the genres and how have you kind of gone into each throughout your career? Well, it's funny because when I was young, I was criticized for not being very flexible. And I, because when I was 18, 19, 20 studying, it was, no, you can only play the music one kind of way and don't do all these other things. But just like with a lot of things in life, as you get older, you realize the world is not black and white as shades of gray. And so same thing with other things. As I got older, I realized, okay, well, you know, you can play other styles of music. You don't have to kind of just be stuck in this one thing. And I'm fortunate a lot of the LA stuff came from, I have a f- close friend I went to college with. He was working in LA. And so that's how a lot of those doors open. But I'm also fortunate that the projects I've done are still in my wheelhouse. It's not me playing background keyboards with Justin Bieber. It's, I'm actually playing kind of similar music to that I already play. It just happens to be with pop acts. So, so it isn't completely out of the wheelhouse. It's still kind of what I do. I'm curious what you think of the word jazz, because Ah. Nicholas Payton has been talking a lot of course with BAM, Black American Music, and talked about how Charles Mingus didn't like the term because it was seemingly uh, pejorative for him. And so how do you think of that? And do you think there's a future in which it would be a good thing to move past that? I mean, this is a whole lecture series on the, I mean, Nicholas is right. And I agree with him. I think I use the word more because it's confusing when I don't. So I don't necessarily use it because I believe in it wholeheartedly. I kind of use it when I'm discussing things with people because it's when you say the word, certain connotations and people are like, oh, you mean this, this and this. But he is right. It is, you know, and a, a lot of other people it wasn't just Mingus. Coltrane talked about how it was just a uh, just a concept for record labels to kind of sell records. And then even when you look at the history of it, I think it was 1918, the original Dixieland jazz band, which was the first recorded jazz band, was an all white band. So it is a, it's an interesting term that, like I said, I use it more just for recognition's sake when I'm talking with people, but it kind of is more, if you want to get detailed about it, is just kind of an improvisational form of black American music. Um, when we're getting down to the bones of it. So, I mean, Nicholas is right. I think the thing that, and he's not even wrong in this presentation, but I think like with most things, when you're blunt, people people want things sugar-coated. I, I guess it's when you're teaching, they tell you to teach like the cookie effect is like, oh, the sandwich. It's mm. compliment, critique, comp- right. And so I think people want him to come out and say, well, but he's not that. He just said, no, this is what it is. And it was interesting, the blowback that he got, because this was, he did this, what was it, eight years? It's been a while since he started. And it's it's funny how things are cyclical, because at the time there was a lot of blowback. But now that I guess it's a little more in vogue for people to talk about, I guess everybody in the world is calling it woke, which that's a whole nother conversation, how that word's getting taken over. But it's funny, because now everybody's talking about, oh, well, you know, we should be aware of these things. And so, yeah, I mean, he he's absolutely right. Um, cause I've, I've gotten in many Facebook keyboard warrior arguments with people who want to argue, Oh, it's not black American music. It's like it is. And it's fine. That's okay. That doesn't mean you can't play it. That doesn't mean you can't contribute to it, but it's completely okay to say, to acknowledge like where the music came from. I wanted to ask you that because of your My Americana album in which it seemed like there was a lot of intention in turning some things on its head and thinking of jazz as, you know, 
thinking of like the 50s of times where you got, you know, um, milkshakes or something and kind of a romanticized past. So can you share some of the thinking of that album and has it changed at all or um, how are you thinking of it now? No, I mean, you're exactly right. My whole intent with My Americana was to be just that my version of America. Um, And so that's why I did either it was something original composition or something composed by a black composer. And so it, it was just almost my, I guess, ode to black American music. And especially with it being like my debut record, I was like, well, what better way to do this than to kind of kind of cover the music I grew up listening to. And, so, and it's not just jazz. I mean, my mother was a music teacher, so there was all kinds of music in the house. And so it would be nothing to listen to Stevie Wonder and then turn around and listen to a record of Louis Armstrong or Ella Fitzgerald. And then I remember she had uh, the Michael Jackson, like Michael Jackson record. So I would listen to that. So it was my way of saying, okay, well, I want to, in the way that I play, cover all this music. And so, and honestly, I, I've really thought about future records. I mean, because I don't see myself putting out like hundreds, but I could see myself doing My Americana Volume 2 and just kind of stick like it works. Like why waste the energy coming up for a new title? Just do volumes of the same thing. So, I mean, I think Winton did that. He had his standard time, Volume 1, Volume 2. So it it may stick. That that may just be the title that I use. And to what extent do you use jazz as a vehicle for, if we can call them political messages, or is there spirituality that's in the mix? You also play organ at church, and um, it just seems like there's a lot of these different themes, or right. or at some point, is it just about the music? It depends. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, all the time, it's one way or the other. There's been moments in my life where music has been incredibly spiritual and I, and I guess overall that's always the underlying thing it is my way of communicating things that cannot be I guess conveyed by words so there's always this underlying spiritual component to it but depending on what's happening in your life it's going to take on different meanings um, I know there's been times where like I remember in college uh, my grandfather died and I had to play at a friend's recital the I think it was like the next day or the next week it was something very close by and I had to play body and soul and everybody came up to me because these are people that I went to school with they were like I've never heard you play like that so obviously what I was going through emotionally came out in, in the song so I think it just it depends I mean when my son was born my music took a different direction because it, it just meant it was just a, a whole nother layer of meaning to every time I play. What so, do you mean? Would you share more about that? Well, I think most musicians kind of go through, which you kind of have to, you have to be very selfish, which I think, I mean, Michael Jordan was my favorite athlete growing up. I, I, I love Tiger Woods. I love the drive of Kobe Bryant. There's a, there's a theme with all that. You have to be incredibly selfish uh, because there is no room for anything or anyone else. And so that's easier to do when you're 18, when you're 20. But when you have a child, it's, oh, there's now something that is more important, not just in my music, but more important than myself. And so all those old reasons just, it's no longer, I want to be the best piano player in the world. That's still there, but it's it's way down there. Now it's just, I want to be a good dad. And so, or it's just like, he comes to my shows. I, I went to a festival about a month ago and he came with me. And it's, so it's now it's just he'll, like, he'll ask me questions. So it's a different, the music isn't a self-serving, I want to, imp- you know, I want to prove something to somebody. It's more just, oh, you know, I'm sharing this with him or, so it's like you, you become a lot more in tune to, I guess, the emotional component of what the music is versus the musicians. Because when you're young, it's, you know, you go to a jam session and, you want to kind of, they, they call it cutting contest, where you want to cut the other person and you want to be able to, if they're playing rhythm changes fast, or I want to be able to play it faster. And, and I'm 41, I don't care anymore. It's <laughs> And part of that is my son. Part of it is just you're getting older, but a lot of that is there's something way more important when I'm done with this. This is, this is I'm, I still love this, but there's something way more important going on. Yeah. 
I was so impressed that he got up and asked a question at your show in this room full of adults. And it was a very insightful question wow. about jazz. And is it is he also learning the music from you and you're an educator yourself? And so I would see that as a natural mentorship. Yeah, that, I think most parents would say teaching their child anything is challenging. So <laughs> he's talented, but I, I kind of take a wait and see approach because the time the the few times I've given them lessons it ends up in arguments and somebody storming off so it's I, I want to kind of leave it more up to him he says now he wants to be an engineer so it's like hey like that's great let's work on your math and science so uh, it, we'll see I mean sometimes I'm like well maybe I should just let him study with somebody else but I mean he's interested and obviously there's been, I mean, there's been studies on the effect that music has on your know, on academics. So I, I probably will get him a little more involved, but it, it definitely doesn't want to be one of those where I feel like I'm dragging him into it and making him do. I don't want to do that. Of course, your early influence in piano and jazz was from your mother who gave you lessons. What was that like? And it seemed like it was not until later on where you decided to professionally launch your career. So, yeah, so because my mom, because my mom was a music teacher, she also used to teach piano lessons at the house. So according to her, when I was two or three, I would always climb up on the piano after lessons and try and bang out what I heard the, the kids playing. So, yeah, she was my first teacher, but it was also kind of to me a cautionary tale why I'm I don't know about teaching my son, because I quit playing piano in fourth grade. And part of it, I remember her teaching me and by maybe nine or 10, I was like, I'm done. I remember a lesson, I was like, I'm done. I just like threw my piano book on the ground. I was like, I want to go play football with my friends. And I didn't start again until seventh grade. Hmm. So it's, you do get a head start when a parent teaches you, but it's, 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 it's a difficult kind of thing. So, but I guess the good thing is I came back to it because I wanted to. And so uh, I took, I, I quit. Part of it was I was in boys choir. And so just the time to do it uh, became impossible. But when I came back, I actually started taking piano lessons with the woman that taught her when she was in college. Oh, wow. And so that was kind of, so seventh grade was kind of the, okay, I'm pretty good at this. And I think I'm gonna start taking it serious. So that's when I started practicing every day. Nobody had to tell me and I, you know, started, you know, I took, a few jazz lessons that summer with Chip Crawford, who uh, was a pianist who used to live here, who's the pianist for uh, Greg Reporter now. Uh, so I, I got started then and also played in band. So that was kind of when it was like, okay, I think I'm going to be pretty serious about music. And then ultimately you decided to go to Loyola, which is sometimes hard to say, yeah. <laughs> and decided to pursue jazz there, got a master of music, followed by that experience. So what made you decide to do that in college? And was that already the vision to take this seriously in a professional setting afterwards? Yeah, definitely by, I was already doing all the, I guess, stereotypical kid who's going to do music things in high school. I was in band, I was in jazz band i was taking lessons uh but the, i don't think it was a question of whether or not i was going to major in music the question was what instrument i was going to play because i actually was a trumpet player and well i played tuba in middle school and then trumpet in high school so i thought well i'm gonna be a trumpet player and then of course i got down to new orleans which is one of the city for brass and i went and heard somebody play like the first week and put the trumpet down put it in this case put it under my bed and that was <laughs> And then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to stick with piano. But no, I, I think with the fortunate thing about music, um, and I think it's much tougher for other professions, is you get a calling pretty early about it. Like, you kind of know. With other things, like, I don't think there's a lot of... I think kids say, oh, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a doctor, but that changes by the time you're 18. Uh, but I think with music, you kind of get that itch pretty early, and then you're just trying to figure out, well where should I go? And so knowing that I want to do jazz, it was pretty, I, I was leaning towards, well, maybe I should go to New Orleans, but I did, you know, we, we auditioned at Oberlin, my mom, we, we went up there, University of Miami, University of South Carolina. And then because I knew Jim Ketch from playing trumpet and cause he, he knew my band director, I was like, well, I'll audition at University of North Carolina too. Uh, and so, 
what's funny is I actually was going to go to the University of South Carolina because they gave me like all the money. Mm-hmm. It was they paid for everything. Plus, like it was just everything. It was like, oh, this is a great package. And then, of course, I had a girlfriend at the time. I was like, oh, well, I'll be four hours away from her. And fortunately, the head of the jazz program direct uh, program uh, at Loyola, John Mahoney, gave me a call the day I was going to sign the contract for South Carolina. And he said, you know, you, we really were impressed with your audition. You won't come in and be the best, but you'll fit in pretty well here. And at South Carolina, it was the opposite. They say, oh, you're going to be our top guy. You're going to be in all the top bands. And so part of me, even though I was 17 and arrogant, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be the top guy. But that other part was like, you know you need to get better. And so when he said you won't be the best, and then it was New Orleans, I changed my mind and then told my mom, I was like, I'm going to go to Leola. So, so yeah, and then I had a great time. I was in New Orleans for six years, had a great time, learned, I mean, so much about the music. So, I mean, it's uh, I wouldn't trade that for the world. And you played with Jason Marcellus in the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra there as well. Yeah, I got a chance to play with a lot of a lot of great New Orleans musicians. Some, uh, even the ones that I only did once, like, um, why am I? Oh gosh, I can't remember her name. It was a singer and she actually just passed um, this year. I can't, rem- I'm gonna remember her name as soon as this goes off, but but she was just a uh, Topsy Chapman. Topsy Chapman in Solid Harmony. And uh, she so she did a group for her daughters and so, Even that, I did that gig once and got fired because she was doing more like rhythm and blues and those kind of things. And I remember, but this is one of those things that sticks with you among all the other experiences. But she called me the next day and she was old enough to be my grandma. So she was like, baby, you're very talented, but you did not listen to my music. And I said, no, Miss Chapman, I listened to it. She's like, I understand what you're saying. You listened to it, but you thought you didn't really have to do it exactly the way And so that was a learning experience. Like, oh, well, just because I can play all these fancy chords has nothing to do with the music she wants to do. And so there were a lot of experiences like that where I think a lot of times, and I tell this to younger musicians all the time, and Branford said it on that, what was that, that Ken Burns when he said, well, what have you learned from your students? He's like, well, my students are full of crap. (laughs) But that is a thing. It's where people just want to be told how good they are and what they do well. And the thing I learned from that was there's something that you don't do well at all. And if you want to be able to get calls from people and be trusted by people, you need to work on this. Like, this is a problem. Like, excuse me, like this lady said, you're talented, but I will not call you again. So it was a lot of things like that, you know, trying to learn how to play traditional New Orleans music. Like I, same kind of thing. I was like, oh, well, it's easy. I don't have to work on it. You get on a gig. And they tell you to take a solo and you're not doing that. Everybody's looking at you. And so I take way more away from those learning experiences, just being in, I call it hostile environments, like musical hostile environments where it's the crowd is looking at you. Because the thing about New Orleans crowds, it's very different than other places. Mm-hmm. New Orleans, people are very educated about what the music should sound like. You can fool people in other places. You cannot fool people in New Orleans. So it's like, get on a gig on a traditional new orleans gig and they you're supposed to sound like james booker or dr john and you're playing some foolishness they'll just nobody will clap and they'll just look at you but you you learn from those things so i mean new orleans all those kind of things i learned you know about how you know i used to see kids playing like playing marching band instruments and and all those kind of things and i would see how like how good they were rhythmically at young ages so you just realize that there's there's this other part because i i i mean i am a music nerd i'm very math uh oriented and so but new orleans taught me like no there's this whole other side of that of this that has nothing to do with the math of it and it completely kind of transformed my playing so no love love new orleans Now that you're at a much different place in your career, and if someone you hired on a gig was not truly listening to your music, how would you be able to tell? How would you describe maybe after the gig? Here are some of the things you may have missed. I guess another way of asking that is just how you characterize your style now. Well, some things I would tell them are probably not appropriate for the the camera. Uh, (laughs) Fair enough. Because sometimes I'm old school. You do need to be blunt with people. But again, as I age, it's a, 
the energy it takes to do that. I don't have as much as I used to. But a lot of times I'm just very blunt with people. It's you don't sound good because of this. Now, what I don't agree with is when people are negative with no solution. And it goes with anything, relationships, your job, anything. It's nobody likes the person that's negative and it's just like, oh, well, you're terrible. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, it's fine to say that if it's, it's like, hey, you sounded terrible at this because you didn't do boom, boom, boom. And if you do this, it'll get better. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times that's what I'll tell a lot of people is, hey, but what's funny though, because people know me, I don't even have to say it. A lot of people be like, hey man, I know that sounded bad. What can, but they'll say, what did you hear that I can, and I'll tell them, well, it's like, you're you correct, it sounded bad, but this, this, and this. So it's usually just a very direct, there's no hand holding, there's no collins, just, hey, you're not doing this, you're not listening to this. If you do it, you'll get better. So it's pretty a direct approach. I think the sandwich method for me is even more confusing because now I have not just one thing, but three things, and I don't know what's true or not. And and does that mean that the first and last thing are necessarily wrong? So I'm sure as an educator, you are very practiced in giving feedback. And I think there can be something that's really good about the directness. Well, the, the sandwich method works for kids. And that's one thing I learned as a parent is you cannot just come like constantly with negative things. And so I think for secondary school, yeah. I mean, really K through eight, hey, hey guys, we did really, really good at this. Let's work on this. Both adults are like, hey, let's come on. College, like college, we're adults. It's hey, from that point on. And I, I think it is, you don't, now you don't have to destroy somebody's confidence in doing that. But it's it's still, I think people appreciate directness. Cause like you said is, if you're doing all this other stuff, it's, well, were they just hyping me up? Or I don't, you know, cause a lot of times I've seen that where students will ask like an older musician, well, how do you think I sound? They, well, you sound good. And the student knows. Mm-hmm. And so it's just like, no, just tell them, hey man, you know, you don't sound that good. Like what, <laughs> but, but, what, but what are you practicing? What are you, so yeah, it's, it always, what I found is if direct doesn't work, it's usually because the person doesn't really want to get better. Mm-hmm. And so, but to me, but it still works. You know, I mean, when I taught at ECU, I had my first month, I think three people quit in the jazz program that were like in a combo or in my studio. And I got invited to the director of the School of Music office. He was like, you know, this is a little concern. I was like, it's not concerning at all. I was like, all I'm doing is weeding out the people that don't want to be here. Mm-hmm. I said, I didn't say anything personal to them. I didn't, it's just, I told them this is what's required. And one by one, they started. But what's funny is uh, one girl, I remember she ended up majoring in, in English. I saw her and her husband about five years ago. They came to a show I was doing and she gave me this big hug. She was like, thank you. Mm-hmm. She's like, because I, I didn't want to do it. You know, one guy wanted to be a pastor. And so it's all those things are always like, no, it's, people thank you eventually but at the time they didn't they yeah. you you get a, a lot of bad reviews and all those kind of things so but it, it always works eventually what does teaching look like for you right now are you teaching privately well i do a little adjunct teaching at uncg mm-hmm. but that's that's it like i the energy it takes to teach somebody every week and to keep up with their progress uh, cuz some parents will come up to me and say oh my child's i, I I just don't have, I don't have it in me because it's, to be effective at it, especially with younger people, I think you really, really have to, and there's, I just don't have the the energy to do it. So yeah, that's all I do. I teach a handful of students at UNCG. And I got to see you at Sharp Nine as we talked about, and I know you've been at a jam recently, but what kinds of things are you looking forward to for the remainder of this year or some other recording um, ideas that you might have? Oh, well, I'm I'm not retired. That's that's a too strong of a word. But compared to where I was, because I think where you see most musicians is you see them doing like a lot of gigs, like they're three or four times a week, like constantly doing gigs. And so a few years back, I kind of wanted to wean myself off of that just because it's it it's the the cost of it's really high and i think you don't even realize it until you take a step away when you're constantly playing and it's not art mm-hmm. let's say you're just playing at a bar or a restaurant and it's loud and people are just kind of you when you're young that's fine but the older you get 
it starts to wear on you. You get in your car and you're like, man, like nobody was listening. Then you like you can't sleep, and you know it's like I, I was trying to play my songs and nobody cared. And so, what I've tried to focus on these last few years, and pretty much I think it kind of started maybe right before COVID was I just want to do concerts, just something. I don't want to play private parties or play at a bar or no. I just want to do concerts. And something else I realized is scarcity and demand. If people can see you for free every week. When you have a concert, they're going to be a lot less likely to fork over, you know, whatever the fee is. So it's mm-hmm. when you only see me two or three times a year, it's like, oh, no, I definitely have to catch his show because we, we're not going to see him. So so that's kind of the approach I have. And, you know, and then when stuff comes up, I'm supposed to actually be working with uh, a wonderful vocalist, Lois DeLoach, and uh, producing a record for her. That should be sometime soon. Uh Fingers crossed, you know, Tony, Tony, Tony with uh, Rafael Sadiqo, I did a tour with uh, right before COVID hit. They're doing a reunion tour. I may be doing that. So, so if that's, if I do that, that'll be, you know, a few, you know, multiple months out of my time. So it's, that's kind of where I am. It's, you know, do some concerts, do big things if, if I, if I get a chance and uh, maybe at some point, you know, do some more recording. I actually have a recording in the can when I did uh, My Americana. Me and Ariel, uh, well, it was Polka, but it's Ringo now. We did a lot of writing that year. So we, there's actually another record that hasn't been released of oh mine and her, like, just writing. And so that's probably next. Like, I mean, that was 2018. So mm-hmm. so probably releasing that. And then at some point, just kind of figuring out, well, what musically do I want to do and tr- trying to tackle that. Mm-hmm. Is there anything you would do differently looking back and you were speaking to the kind of necessity of doing gigs at a certain stage in your career? And so maybe part of that is just par for the course. But reflecting back, are there any things that, if not regret, would just be different? Yeah, I I think, well, it's one of my favorite shows, TV shows was Monk. And he would say it's a gift and a curse. So my gift and the curse was is my hard headedness and being stubborn. It works because you stick with the sound you have in your head until you get to it. But I probably could have gotten to it a lot faster had I been more willing. Uh, a lot of older musicians in New Orleans, Delphio was was one of them. I, I played with him for a few years before I left. And he was always telling me to listen to certain things. And I would just flat out be like, no, I'm not, I'm not. So a big one was his dad, Ellis Marsalis. And so he would like take me to his dad's house. And I remember once I did an intro on some song and he didn't like it. So he took me to his dad's house. He was like, well, play it for E. So I played it. And his dad was like, it sounds fine to me. But he he wanted me to kind of check out things to kind of, cause I, I liked what I liked. And I think unfortunately when you're young, you don't realize liking what you like is, cause you don't, you don't know any better. You don't know anything. And so that would be the one thing because I'm not big on regret just because your path is your path the things you it's, it's the butterfly effect if you didn't do this then who knows what a, but i definitely know had i been more receptive to things it may have helped me progress faster because i wouldn't have maybe not maybe but those people knew what they were talking about so i probably should have taken it to heart a little more as someone who's been in the education system for a while i'm sure you've seen a lot of how different programs are run in jazz and uh, what are your thoughts on how there's been you know an institutionalization of jazz music which certainly has benefits especially thinking about resources and partnerships but then there's not perhaps more of the grassroots approach to learning in a community i'm not a fan at all Uh, and i think like you said the benefit is i've been on both sides so i wasn't a fan of it as a student definitely wasn't a fan of it as I kind of got a peek behind the curtain and I taught. And, and the biggest reason why is because classical music is older, there's more canon for what you're supposed to study. So if you're a uh, pianist and you're doing any kind of classical studies, there's not a lot of argument on should you study Bach or should you study Beethoven or should you it's like, or should you study Mozart? There, there are not a lot of arguments about that. Mm-hmm. but. And I, and I think because of that, there's at least a baseline of expectations of if you're a classical pianist, you should be able, you should be familiar with these works. The problem with jazz is 
because one is not as old. The, the other big problem is, you know, you have a lot of people who end up teaching it who have no idea what they're talking about. Just to be blunt, it's they went to school for it. They never really played with anybody. So everything they know is something they learned, you know, in school. And so now we have this issue of, OK, well, what's the base requirement? What should a if a pianist, you know, if somebody comes to school to learn jazz piano, what should they be studying? You ask five different piano teachers, they'll say five different things. And so the problem with that is it's it's very murky what the standard is of, of this is what, you know, when you graduate, you should be able to do these things. And so, yeah, I, I'm not a huge fan because it, it's almost more of a disservice to musicians studying because you get caught in this, what if your teacher doesn't know what they're talking about? Mm. Says, Excuse me, there's nothing you can do. It's and then they, they affect your grade, there's all these things. So now yeah, that's not to say they aren't. You know, like Thomas Taylor, the drum, excuse me, instructor at Central, he's a master instructor. He's taught a lot of people. You look at just if you go back fifteen years, if somebody study it plays drums in this area, it's because they studied with Thomas. You know, but for every Thomas there's maybe two or three people who don't really know what they're talking about. Um, and so, and I think what's, what I've noticed recently is the way I learned, I don't see as many kids doing because it's almost this double-edged sword because it's available more on YouTube or now you have, like every time I look, there's a jazz program in North Carolina at a university. I'm like, well, who are all these people teaching? And so when I came up, it was, we might've been the last generation that kind of did it the same way the older school cats did. It was, we knew it wasn't school. It was, no, you got to take your behind to the funky butt and go to the jam session, get your butt kicked. That's where you learn. School was just, you know, do your assignments, get this degree just in case you ever want to teach. But I, I sense now some people actually think, oh no, I'm gonna learn how to play in school. It's like, no. And so there's this disconnect. I was actually talking about it with, you know, some musicians that are close friends, uh, Lance Scott and John Kerr, the guys who actually were on my record. And they were saying, they were like, I don't know what it is, but there is this disconnect between your generation and ours when it comes to playing jazz. Like, we just don't know what we're doing. And I think a lot of that is because they learned it in school, whereas we just went to school, but learned it from, you know, out there playing. So I wish I could have more a more glowing review of, of jazz education, but I yeah, I'm just not a, a big fan of it. Well, to say higher education in the United States is flawed would be a bit of an right, understatement right, right. to go off of not even speaking about jazz. Um, but I appreciate your thoughts on that. Perhaps you're more of the visionary of this is how it could be totally outside of the system or with a totally new one. So it's a two pronged question or two options, I suppose. One would be what would that system look like or um, how could that future look like? or how should students operate within a flawed system right. to make up the difference in the kind of gap that you've been noticing? Well, yeah, it's, I mean, I guess because the, the train has already left the station. There is no, I don't think there's going, I think you're just going to see more and more um, places that offer jazz degrees or like when I was in high school, it was me and this kid, Joey Johnson, at Orange High School in Hillsboro that played jazz. That was it. Mm. And like that area. So the good thing is, the good news is every time I look, I see like younger people playing. So that's, that's, that's never going to be a bad thing. The kind of bad news is, it, well, how are they learning? Because every, like, every now and then I'll see one that's learning the right way, which it's rare. They'll be like, oh, I listen to this, this and this is like, oh, wow. But it's usually not because of a teacher. It's usually just because, oh no, I was listening to this, this, and this. And so it's 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 spreading more. It's out there. It's where kids can learn it faster. It's I mean, the resources they have, uh, I mean, there's all district jazz band now, like all these different things. The thing I would kind of caution is well, we just have to make sure the right people are the ones kind of you know, calling the shots on these things. And so what I always tell students is no matter what your situation is, the records are still the same. 
So you can say, oh, well, my college program isn't great or this, this, and this. It's like, well, you know, Miles' records are the same records for the last 60, 70 years, Cold Train. So it's like, there's, there's, you, you only have but so many excuses for not checking out the music. So that's usually what I tell, because I've gotten that that complaint from students where they're just like, I just feel like where I am or the school is. And I was like, well, okay, that's school. What does that have to do with you actually checking out the music more? I was like, yes, it would be great to have a great teacher and a great program. But if you don't, so what? Like, learn. You can learn the same way. Go out to jam sessions, practice, listen to records. So, you know, so it's, it's I, I occasionally will hear somebody young that I'm just like, oh, okay. But overall, I am a little, you know, which has kind of contributed to me like staying in the house a lot more. It's, I'm, I'm a little dismayed by sometimes what I hear uh, from from some of the younger students. Yeah. But then there's professors like Brian Horton, who tragically passed. But there's been so many good professors from North Carolina Central University that we've seen, too. So as you're saying, I think it does seem to be on who is administering or who is right carrying the burden of and responsibility of education. Right. I mean, I mean, obviously me and Brian were extremely close. So, uh, I mean, his, his death, I mean, his death is, it's, it's tragic on a lot of levels. One just, like I said, it was a person that was close to a lot of people. So just on a, on a human level, like losing somebody, I mean, he was 46, Mm -hmm. but to get past like even my own level of personal grief, it was extremely problematic for jazz education because Brian was that person. He was the person that could play, knew about the music, but then also cared deeply about education. So a lot of times when I would go over to his house, I mean, he would like take me in his office. He'd be like, oh yeah, these are some of the things I'm working on. So me and him were almost the opposite when it came to education. He has like a, he had a genuine excitement and fervor for teaching. And so, that's why that layer of his loss is just because and even his ideas about participating in the jazz community. So we would even have discussions where I was just like, at this point, I'm not trying to be out doing stuff all the time. And his thing was like, no, you need to like we need to be out here. And so the jam session he ran at Kingfisher, it was but the thing is, he's done that before. It was um, Tallulah's when I first got in town years ago. So this is- 2010? Oh no, this was 2005 mm-hmm. when he was doing Tallulah's in Chapel Hill. And then the whiskey, that was right before he left to go get his doctor. So he he was really great at being a person who was like involved in the community, like being a fixture. So he was like a fixture on the jazz scene. You would see him at things. And so his his presence is missed because he was that guy that kind of, he kind of lived in all those, whereas I'm more of a recluse at this point where it's just like, oh, I'll come out every now and then. He was out there every week playing and, and then going to Central and teaching. So, so yeah, he, I, I tell people all the time, like you want to make an impact with education, be like Brian. Mm. Like be a person who your students respect your playing, but then you come in and you're like, oh yeah, I'm no slouch at this side of it too. So yeah, he was he was a very special person. And if, I think if more people could be like that, I think Thomas Taylor is kind of like that. You have a person who is, is a good drummer and then a, a, a good teacher. So it's just like a student can't find any wiggle room because students are crafty. If they can find a wiggle room, they'll, they'll, but it's, so those people are really important. People who play effectively and then can teach effectively too. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here, even if you're, you know, not yeah. maybe at all of the jams. And so it feels even more special to have you here. For my last question, I actually want to lean on one that someone else has asked before oh. and ask you, what's a favorite question you've gotten from the audience in these recent conversations and gigs? And how did you answer? I think, let's see, my favorite question was probably, it may have been the the one I mentioned before in Wilmington when a person asked, where do I, like, what do I think the state of jazz, like, where do I feel it is? And the reason that might've been my favorite question is, we stopped and we talked about that for about five minutes mm-hmm. and nobody got antsy. 
Like, so, like, everybody was engaged. You could tell, like, everybody was kind of enthralled because he was actually up in, like, the balcony and everybody was kind of looking back. So it was, but I, I, the reason I like that question is it, it showed a thoughtfulness on the audience's part for him to ask that question. But it's actually a, a conversation that I know I have regularly with a lot of my peers. Where, like, where are we? Are we in a good place? Is you know so, so yeah. I definitely think that was my most memorable one because it, because a lot of times you'll get, I guess the you'll get cute questions, like somebody was like, oh well, we saw your Grammy nominated. You know who was that with? It's more like a so, it would, but I think the ones where it's like, oh wow, like this is a, like this is a whole another conversation. And the person actually came to me afterwards. We talked about it a little bit more. So I, th I think it's always those. It's the ones that are a little more thoughtful and, you know, you actually can have a dialogue with people. But no, I think that one sticks out among all the questions. And can I ask what your answer to that would be now? We can either talk from the triangle scene because this is a series about right. local jazz and beyond, but um, or from a more national stage. I mean, it's... <sighs> It's interesting because it's one of those questions that obviously isn't necessarily objective. I mean, it, it would kind of be based on what people are, if we're talking about specifically like the triangle scene, like what are people looking to get out of it? Mm -hmm. So my thing is, like I have a couple of, when I discuss this with people, a couple of talking points. One, uh, are musicians getting paid any greater than they were getting paid? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like, okay, well, when I talk to older musicians, they're like, oh yeah, we were making that in the eighties. Okay, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of venues and you can, there's music everywhere, that is different. When I was in high school, well, one, when I was in high school, there was no downtown Durham. Down, it was not safe to be in downtown Durham. So, but I mean, that's a whole nother conversation about the positives and negatives of, I guess you call it reurbanization or revitalization. But so, I mean, the scene is interesting. It's, there's, I guess the easiest way I could think about the triangle scene, it's, there's a lot of places to play. There's a lot of people playing, but sometimes, and I've, and this is not just recently, but sometimes I feel um, like it's, I guess the, the, the best term I could use is almost like musical anarchy. There's no standard. So there's no standard of good music. And so and that's a problem. It's not a problem in terms of, I believe everybody should have access to play. So it's not, it's not trying to be a gatekeeper saying, Oh, well you can't play. I think the danger is though, when the audience or when people don't know what the professional music is from, let's say somebody who's just a nine to five who likes playing on the weekends, when that's not, when that, I guess when that's not made clear. And so the thing I've all, and the argument I've always had with people here is where is, like, where do you go to be great? And so, yeah, there's a lot of places to play, but where do you go where it's just like, oh, where, who are the, who are the pockets of people like, yeah, I really want to be great at this music. Um, and so that's something where, but obviously that's my subjective opinion from me wanting to get that out of it. So, you know, somebody else might be like, oh, I just liked, uh, like Seagrace, it's a perfect example. A lot of people love Seagrace in terms of they went, you could get something to drink and you could hear some people play. But somebody like me was just like, eh, like, what is this? What are we really like? Who is this serving? Like, are we getting better? Is this, you know, so that's why I said it's, it's a it's a complicated question. It's because not not everything is for everybody. So it's I, the, the good thing is, I think the triangle presents opportunities for people to play. But sometimes I wonder, OK, well, where you want to take that next level? Are we really as are we pushing for that? And that's more of a musician thing, not necessarily the audience, but it's like, where is that happening? So it's like I said, it's, it's kind of complicated. It's, you know, I'll say it's better than it was when I, you know, so let's say over the last 20, 25 years, I see improvement. But that's that's kind of what I would like to see. And that's why I like Sharp Nine so much. I guess kind of to wrap up that whole idea is I feel like Sharp Nine presents 
concerts and you know you you can see like serious concerts and so i think sometimes we got to get out of that doing like a gig and just kind of playing in a corner like no you know we can do serious music and push and try and get better so so yeah it's but i'm also i'm a curmudgeon so i mean i'm i'm always and i don't even think i'm a glass half empty kind of guy i'm just a realist it's i think everybody could be better. I think I could be better. I think everybody could be pushing like a little more to be like better at the music. So, so that's kind of my Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge, you know, bah humbug. Like it's okay, but it could be better. So, so yeah. I think curmudgeons get a bad rap because right. I think what you're talking about is having standards and wanting to be excellent and right. wanting to see excellence. And that's not just criticizing everything. I right. think there's a difference. Right. right. No, I mean, I, I take the music incredibly seriously and that doesn't mean i take it too seriously but i you know i remember one of the things delphio told me which is one of the things that that stuck um it was actually one of my last weeks in new orleans i mean none of us knew but it was like a week or two before katrina Mm -hmm. and me and him were at a jam session and he put his hands on my shoulders he was like how big are these i was like man what are you talking about i was like i I lift a little bit but he's like no man not physically but like how big are your shoulders? Cause it's like, you're next. You're, you're gonna be one of the torch bearers and you gotta have big shoulders. He's like, because this is the music John Coltrane played. And so I always remember that. Cause I think sometimes people do think, oh like, oh man, you take it too serious. It's like, no man, like Coltrane did this, Bird did this. They did this in an environment that was hostile for them just to live in. Mm-hmm. Oh, the least we can do is take it seriously. So. It, it's not so much like I have fun when I'm playing, but I'm definitely one of those, you know, this is this is serious music. Like the, our, you know, our musical ancestors, like they they lived and died by this to to you know learn how to play this. Like the least you can do is treat it with respect. So I will, I do always kind of take that side of like, eh, like it could be better. So so no, but I definitely I take it seriously, and I think because of that, that's why I'm always trying to figure out like, well, how can we. How can we, you know, elevate? How can we take this to the next level? I like how you seem to ask and invite reverence for the art and the for quality music. Ernest, thank you so much for joining. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you'd want to share? No, I think we covered a lot. No, though, thanks for having me, though. It's been really fun talking. Thank you so much.